All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And yeah, I'll echo everyone's sentiment. This has been a great meeting. I'm a little bit of an outsider, um, but it's been an absolute delight to uh, get all the extra context on HIV to help understand some of the challenges in solving these problems. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this uh, presentation has already been covered. The two key new ideas, I guess, are that um, we're trying to take the Cas9 enzyme itself and turn it into an all-in-one <laughs> self-contained uh, delivery platform. And um, one thing that helps do that is uh, these endosomalytic peptides. Um, so those are kind of a key element. Um, You've heard plenty today uh, and yesterday about viral vectors and nanoparticles. Uh, these things work great. Um, they have some uh, disadvantages, and if you sat down and tried to imagine a, a totally ideal platform, um, you know, some of these things are, are not advantageous. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about um, how we imagine uh, transforming the Cas9 enzyme itself into a, basically an ideal delivery platform. And some of those platforms, or sorry, some of those properties are um, the fact that the RNP itself um, doesn't involve any overexpression, so you would be uh, less at risk for cell-mediated immune responses. Um, this is made out of recombinant components that we can make uh, with great ease and for very low cost, and uh, this should reduce manufacturing challenges um, and increase reproducibility. Um, the enzyme itself doesn't have any capability to get into the cell. So what we can do is engineer all of those properties. So we can do cell targeting, like we've heard about today, and then we can um, specifically kind of activate the enzyme for escape from cellular compartments. And this should give us uh, precision in cell targeting that's really hard to achieve with these other vectors. Um, it's really, really small. So the enzyme is only about uh, 12 nanometers across, and most nanoparticles are 100 nanometers. Um, AAV is around 25 nanometers across. So this is you know, uh, an eighth or a half the size of some of these other vectors. So we think that's going to let us get better biodistribution and uh, access to some different cellular compartments. Um, and when you use the enzyme uh, as its own delivery entity, uh, it has a transient spike of activity, and this has been shown to reduce off-target effects uh, as far as genomic modifications go. So um, the enzyme isn't expressed. You just put it in, it gets degraded pretty quickly, and uh, hopefully you can get enough editing during that window, and then it's gone. So, you know, that sounds like a wonderful um, array of capabilities. Uh, I wish I could give it to you. It doesn't exist yet. And so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, our attempts to engineer the extra functions onto Cas9. So Cas9 comes with two great properties built in. You can program it using its uh, guide RNA to bind any target sequence you want. And then the protein component it was responsible for cutting the DNA and initiating genome editing. Um, the two other uh, abilities we want to build in are the ability to navigate to a specific cell um, and hopefully be taken up. And then we need to open up the cellular compartments um, to let it get to the nucleus and finally do the genome editing that um, hopefully can enact therapeutic change. So this is the roadmap that we imagine Cas9 taking um, in our specific uh, brand of cell-specific targeting. So it really involves two key steps, and these uh, involve distinct engineering approaches. So the first step is to um, activate cell-specific targeting. And so we've seen some of this already. Um, Leah's talk is probably the closest, because um, she was targeting using this ASGR receptor, which we also have started using. And um, I think there will be another talk from uh, Sarah this afternoon that's going to talk about some antibody-mediated targeting. So anything that gets you to a specific cell surface is kind of the first step. Um, ideally, your recognition will trigger endocytosis, and then you're inside just the cells that you want to target. Um, and a really, really big challenge for the entire field of macromolecular delivery is the second step, the endosomal escape. So getting out of the cellular compartment um, so that you're in the cytosol, and uh, finally getting traffic to the nucleus. And this is something we kind of take for granted because NLS tags do this pretty efficiently. So um, the first part of my talk, I'm going I'm to tell you about some of our sort of uh, non T cell related work um, trying to get Cas9 into liver cells, and we're doing that using um, a, a targeting moiety that is a trimeric um, ligand for this ASGR receptor. So, this is a three Galnax that we conjugated directly to the Cas9 protein, and this was done in, uh, this is done in collaboration with the Doudna lab um, and also Pfizer because they have a, a fancy ligand that has extra high affinity. Um, and, and the big idea was, you know, if we could um, use this ligand, which has already been demonstrated to uh, take things up into hepatocytes, um, so this is how alnylam gets siRNAs into the liver, um, if we could use this to get Cas9 into the liver, that's kind of the first step on our path. 
So to find out if this conjugated navigation molecule is doing its job, um, we fluorescently tagged Cas9 um, with a red fluorophore and checked the ability for this thing to get into cells, um, whether it had the ligand or whether the ligand was gone. So, um, yeah, the fluorophore labeled Cas9 with the ligand accumulated really nicely, as you can see in this uh, time-resolved microscopy, so lots of uh, intracellular staining. And if Cas9 doesn't have the ligand, we saw very, level, very low levels of uptake, um, sort of some extracellular staining going on. So this is quantification, and we can see a really, really nice spike, especially in these um, early physiologically relevant time points. And uh, there is some background uptake um, because these cells like to sort of gobble uh, whatever is around them. Um, we were also curious uh, to see what would happen in cells that don't have that receptor, and whether you have the receptor or not, you see sort of low levels of uptake. So this is encouraging. We were able to get Cas9 into these cells in a way that seemed to be receptor-mediated and ligand-mediated, so you need both pieces. Um, but when we extracted the nuclei from these cells and checked them from genome editing, there's absolutely zero genome editing. And the reason why that was the case is because um, if you don't actively escape from the endosome, you just get trafficked to the lysosome and you, your molecule will be degraded. So um, to counteract this problem, we rely on a molecule um, known as an endosomalytic peptide. So this is a small molecule that is selectively active just in the acidic environment of the late endosome. So these peptides, which are corkscrews for opening things up, um, these peptides are really nice because uh, they're selectively active. So um, most membrane-penetrating pe peptides will have some amphiphilic character, so a lot of grease on one face and a lot of positive charge on the other. And the presence of these histidines means that at neutral pH, this thing is totally hydrophobic. But once you get into an acidic environment like the late endosome, you get protonation here and you get the properties that allow this membrane disruption. So the two really nice things about this are, first of all, it's not toxic. So once you escape the endosome, these peptides don't go around disrupting other membranes. You kind of have a, um, a short time frame where this is active and a selective uh, activity. And second of all, um, it doesn't tend to override your cell targeting. So a lot of the positive charged things that tend to interact, uh, interact with cellular membranes will sort of stick to any cell that you see. So um, this is a selective uh, molecule that doesn't override um, targeted, molecular targeting, basically. So we can use these ELPs in trans, um, just putting them in solution with Cas9, and hopefully if these get taken up, um, they can also escape, uh, they can open the endosome and promote Cas9's escape. Um, I also want to note that there's another related molecule called a cell penetrating peptide, and this tends to be positively charged and hydrophobic um, all the time. And so this is the sort of thing that would kind of override molecular targeting and get you into a cell that doesn't have the receptor or get Cas9 in, if, even if it doesn't have the uh, molecular, molecular targeting agent attached. So I'm going to summarize all of our work to sort of um, enable genome editing using uh, the molecular targeting and the endosomal escape strategy. And this is the work done by Lorena in my lab. Um, so just to put things in context, uh, this is kind of a high bar for editing. This is us uh, electroporating um, or nucleoaffecting the RNP, which is preformed protein and RNA. And um, for this spacer and um, this cell type, we get you know, 20 or 25% as the sort of high bar for editing. So this is kind of our maximum. Um, I guess I want to do a quick callback. You know, we can get much, much higher if we use different locus, different strategies, and um, yesterday we heard about these paired meganucleases that'll boost activity, and we've seen the same thing. So all the editors out there, uh, be sure to try a couple of guides and see what happens, because for us, um, in these cells, we can get up to like 90% indels by NGS. Um, so it's a very powerful strategy. So that's my plug for dual guide. Um, okay, so right, with no modification of the Cas9, we see no editing, which we expect. Um, so when we add these endosomalytic peptides in trans, um, we see a little bit of background editing, um, but our editing, um, when the ligand is present, so the blue bars, um, it, it goes right up to uh, close to the maximal editing. So this is pretty nice, um, and we hope that this background editing um, you know, could potentially drop off in vivo because this is a cell culture where things are just sitting there, right? And there's a lot of chance for background uptake. So this is encouraging. We saw sort of a fourfold enhancement. So um, yeah, that, that could be really good. Um, I mentioned earlier these cell penetrating peptides that can give you the strongest editing, um, but they kind of override your molecular targeting. So this is a, another sort of way to edit that, you know, doesn't seem like it's going to give us that uh, selectivity that we would want for an in vivo application. 
Um, so the big work of my lab for the last few years has been finding a way to um, put these peptides into a context that will be translatable in vivo, because you can't um, put 10 millimolar peptide in the bloodstream, right? We want something you can intravenously administer. And to do that, we really want to find a way to have high local concentrations of these peptides, effectively decorating the RNP itself with these um, membrane-disrupting uh, moieties, just like the surface of an AAV does, for example. So what we did is we modified the guide RNA in its um, sort of scaffold region, the part that doesn't drive editing. So this is the part that targets DNA, and this is kind of a structural region. We put these little handles on for an adapter protein, and we uh, modified these upstream. So this is basically just a way to site-specifically recruit precise numbers of these peptides to the surface. And so through a lot of screening, um, putting different numbers of peptides on in different configurations, we found one setup that was able to give us um, editing that is admittedly not as strong, but it you know, retains the targeting, and um, this should be in vivo compatible, right? Um, another really exciting thing that we found is that if we took the same platform, sorry, here's our negative control. This thing doesn't work in trans, so that's good you know, in, context, uh, in contrast to this. So if we um, took this cell-penetrating peptide and put it on the surface, we actually saw strong editing, and we still retained some of our um, selectivity or some of our receptor-mediated uh, dependency. So um, there's a lot more screening to do here, but I think that uh, it really is a nice proof of concept that it's possible to take this particle and turn it just from an enzyme into a sort of self-delivering enzyme. So, um, we're working this stuff up right now. We're very excited to do the mouse studies that show that this works. I'll tell you right now, you know, our first attempts at mouse work with this certainly doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, we're excited to see if, if, if some of these complexes work in, in, in vivo. Um, and, of course, here's our obligatory ex vivo slide. Um, I think that I'm bringing the representation up a little bit. Um, anyway, yeah, so we all know that um, there's a lot of applications for uh, edited cells, um, either T cells or stem cells, and we all wish that we could edit them in vivo, right? So just like many, many people today, you know, the big objective is to find a way to sidestep this whole process and just use uh, the famous cartoon syringe, right, and put in our reagent. Um, and like others, we're using antibody-mediated targeting uh, to target T cells, right? So I'm going to show you our, our first steps um, towards T cell targeting. And I think T cell targeting should translate well to an in vivo context um, because those cells are very readily available, of course. So, um, to do this, uh, we're, we're just going to follow the same blueprint that we did before. We're going to make sure, first of all, that we can get into the endosome um, in a cell-specific manner, and then we're going to figure out endosomal escape. And so the work I'm about to show you is done by my postdoc, Dana Foss, and um, this is in collaboration with David from Alex Marson's lab, and so this has been a really nice collaboration. Um, yeah, so what we did was we made a fusion of Cas9 to um, a domain that grabs onto the constant region of an antibody. We don't think this is a viable long-term concept, but it's good for proof of concept. We'd much rather use kind of antibody fragments or nanobodies, but um, this is very easy to get off the ground. Uh, the first thing that we did is assemble the whole complex and make sure that it came together. So indeed, we were able to see a shift on uh, chromatography, showing that this uh, complex uh, assembles like we want it to. And then we did some fluorescent tagging of Cas9, just like before, and checked for endosomal uptake. And so indeed, we saw this um, intracellular staining um, in these uh, puncti, and this is consistent with cellular uptake. And so it looks like Cas9 is making it into these endosomes, which is the first step uh, on our journey towards uh, targeted genome editing. In contrast, when we couple Cas9 to a generic array of um, IgG antibodies uh, that shouldn't target anything, um, the only staining that we end up seeing is sort of diffuse uh, extracellular staining. And so if we quantify these two populations, um, this is a 30-minute time point, we can see a good amount of Cas9 associated with T cells um, when OKT3 okay, is there. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is a CD3 targeting antibody, um, and it's been used therapeutically for a long time, and so it induces TCR um, internalization. So sorry, I didn't mention that earlier. So right, the, the C, CD3 targeting uh, antibody gets us lots of association with T cells, and then the um, heterogeneous IgG population doesn't get us much at all. And so one exciting thing that we saw, too, is that we were able to take a population of um, uh, mixed white blood cells, PBMCs, 
And uh, we were able to see that in this mixed population, the Cas9 was still able to be targeted um, into the T cells specifically. So um, we see basically uh, tons of staining in our T cells and pretty low levels of background staining. So again, if you imagine a, a blood-like context, um, this is pretty promising. So the next step, we haven't gotten editing yet, I would be delighted to show you that. But the next step is to find out um, you know, what kind of combination um, of uh, Cas9 and, and peptides located at the surface is appropriate to, to activate this editing. Um, we haven't tried this very exhaustively. Uh, T cells are a little bit tricky to edit in uh, in vivo friendly ways, but that's the next big um, goal for our project is to you know obviously turn on the endosomal escape and enable uh, genome editing in a, a targeted context. So. Um, the work that's coming next is uh, being supported by this uh, big push from the NIH, which um, I'm very excited to be uh, part of. And, you know, watching all the talks today, basically everyone's talk presents the solution, right? But, but we're not there. <laughs> and I think the cool thing about um, what the NIH is doing is really assembling a centralized uh, text, uh, testing center, right? They're going to have mammal testing, um, and they're going to bring in lots of different technologies and all compare them. So it'll be really, really interesting and cool to see what shakes out from this uh, kind of broad spectrum assessment of all the different in vivo directed uh, technologies. So yeah, that's a, a cool thing that I'm very grateful for. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll summarize and um, you know go through the community bullet points. So our big question was, can we selectively deliver genome editing enzymes to T cells? We definitely can. Um, we can get it into the T cells. We haven't shown genome editing yet, but um, I think we're essentially halfway there. Someone laughed at me. They were like, you have 0% editing. No, 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 no. We're halfway there. <laughs> Um, and, and so this is important because, right, if we're able to get Cas9 into the nucleus, as we have done in this liver cell context, um, Cas9 should be able to uh, edit T cells. Um, and again, we can edit stem cells theoretically this way. There's targeting moieties. We don't know if there's great endocytosis triggers, but, um, you know, we have some mechanisms sorted out. Uh, you know, if we had an, uh, extra hands to work on the stem cells, we're very thrilled to go after that, because both these technologies could give us a path towards modified T cells to knock out these uh, host receptors in vivo, as we've seen uh, lots of work on, especially yesterday. Um, and yeah, I guess, as I just kind of covered, this relates to a cure because if you can make HIV immune T cells, right, T cells that are truly resistant, um, yeah, this might give the immune system a chance to fight back and it could be a path towards a cure. So the most important part of all this work is that we really, really do need an accessible approach and it is not ex vivo and we need it to be intravenously administered and we need it to be affordable. So I think everyone today appreciates um, the needs. It's just a matter of finding something that actually gets us there. So um, with that, I just want to thank everyone from my lab who did all the work, um, uh, acknowledge the great collaborators in the Doudna lab, the Marsden lab, and those at Pfizer who uh, are involved in the liver work. And also thank uh, the Innovative Genomics Institute, IGI, for uh, sort of startup funding that has let uh, this work really flourish. So um, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Hi, thank you very much. So uh, since some donors have up to 70% of donors have immunity to Cas9, can you take some serum from those patients and see if it blocks uh, integration here? Yeah, so the immunogenicity is a huge question, right? So whenever anyone sees this, they very rightly say um, Cas9 came from uh, S. pyogenes. That's a, a pathogen. Anyone who's had strep throat, I mean, probably has uh, you know, antibodies against Cas9. So people have done the work to take blood tests and see if there's uh, existing humoral immunity against Cas9. So some people apparently do. Um, it's hard to predict how bad that is. Um, certainly we don't expect to be able to dose anyone twice, right? To put a huge bolus of this stuff in there uh, twice is, is not gonna work. It, we might be able to sneak by with a single dose. Um, and there's also, you know, the standard strategies like pegylation of the surface. Um, furthermore, there are Cas9s that are being discovered from uh, organisms that humans have never seen. And people are also doing work to, um, this might be more relevant to viral delivery, but people are doing work to remove epitopes from Cas9. That's more of a cell-mediated response thing. Um, I think that, yeah, it's an open question, but we're, it's very much on our minds. Thanks. Now it is. The, um, in terms of uh, T cells, it seems like 
at least with certain genes that you target, there's a necessity to activate the T cell to make uh, the cell permissive to editing. The cool thing that you're doing with OKT3 is since you're using it to track to the T cell, there's a possibility that you'll actually have activation through um, the T cell receptor with OKT3. So do you see um, that, that you're actually getting T cell activation during the targeting and does that help to, I guess you, you don't see editing yet, but do you think that you're gonna get this double whammy of both the, the targeting and the activation? Yeah, so that's a spot on question. We are actually very frustrated with like the lack of T cell cell biology and this is one thing that kind of took us on a little bit of a, a, a sidetrack a little bit because we, if you read the literature about what this antibody does, OKT3, what's it do, right? Some people say activate, some people say energy, some people say apoptosis. It, it totally depends on the context. So when people activate T cells using this antibody, it's stuck to a bead. And I think what happens is that the T cell is trying to pull this in and it can't. And I think that's what triggers the activation. Somebody let me know if I'm wrong about this. I actually think that our cells are, are maybe going more in the energy direction, um, but the, the biology is hazy. I mean, the best review you can find has three answers to this question. So um, regarding the activation, yeah, I do suspect that activated T cells edit more readily. I'm not sure that we will be activating this way. I'm not sure that we want to be activating. And if we need to edit something that's just chilled out, I'm a big fan of base editors in theory. And we should be able to deliver base editors this way because we have no size limit, you know, like a viral genome packaging does. Uh, one more. So um, on that note, did you rule out that the endosomal puncta aren't just clustering in the CD3 uh, target because you're ligating it? So you get you get puncta of CD3 on activation. Um, so, when, uh, so, but it would be extracellular, right? So that's what I'm is is do you have you shown that it's intracellular? Um, you right. So I think that we can infer that because. Yeah, that's hard to say. You know, looking at a lot of microscopy, it doesn't seem like it tends to be on the crescent, but that's our best inference. You know what I'm saying? We don't see any cases where, yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it's hard to say. No, 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 I can't, I can't say that for sure. It could be. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.